This is the largest sailing vessel in the world, Royal Clipper, a five-masted square rigger, recalling the glory days of the magnificent clipper ships. Built in the year 2000 at a cost of $60 million, Royal Clipper will safely cross any ocean in any weather. But this amazing super ship has a few surprises never before seen on a sailing vessel. just completing a voyage from Europe to the Barbados. It's a routine trip for this enormous vessel. During the 10-day, 7,000-kilometer voyage, with all sails set and drawing, Royal Clipper will cross the Atlantic at an average speed of about 17 knots, or just over 30 kilometers an hour. Tied up in Bridgetown, Barbados, she occupies an enormous amount of dock space, 133 meters, 439 feet from bowsprit to fantail. Her masts soar to a height of more than 60 meters, as tall as a 20-story building. From her steel hull to her Burma teak decks to her stainless steel rigging, no effort has been spared to build and equip her to capture the winds, challenge the seas, and recreate the experience of sailing aboard the greatest sailing ships the world has ever seen, the Clipper ships. With as many as five masts and 42 huge square-shaped sails, these powerful square riggers were pushed by the trade winds as they carried cargoes of tea and spices from the Far East to the cities of Europe and North America. They were called clippers because they could clip valuable days off a trans-ocean voyage. The most famous of them all, the Cutty Sark, which still survives in Greenwich, England, is only half the length of the Royal Clipper, and at 963 tons is one-fifth the weight. It's always a big challenge to really build true sailing vessels. I've been owning and building ships for about 30 years or so, but uh, Royal Clipper was challenging because I really want to create those sailing vessels the way they were, and I want the wind to be the prime mover. As a 12-year-old, Michael Kraft, owner of the Royal Clipper, often sailed his boat across 20 miles of open water. When I was a boy, I got a ship model for a Christmas once from my father of the Preussen, the only five-mast full ship ever built um, uh, in, in the world so far. And I always loved the ship and I dreamt about it and I said, one day I'm going to build that ship. You know? Michael Kraft's original dream ship was launched in 1902 near Hamburg, Germany. Thousands of spectators lined the banks of the River Geiste to witness the launch of the Preussen, a five-masted steel-hulled sailing ship. Preussen was truly magnificent, 150 meters or 490 feet long. She weighed over 5,000 tons, and when she splashed into the river, she created such a wave that spectators on the opposite bank were soaked up to their knees. Over the next eight years, sailing mainly from South America to Europe, the Preussen could often reach speeds of 18 and a half knots, or 33 kilometers an hour, an amazing speed for a wind jammer. But in the end, her speed would be her undoing. A British postal steamer crossing the English Channel near midnight underestimated the speed of the huge sailing ship bearing down and tried to cross her bow 
causing a disastrous collision. The Preussen, missing a foremast and unable to steer properly, was caught in a sudden gale, blown ashore and lost. Almost a century after the Preussen came to grief below the white cliffs of Dover, Michael Kraft found an unfinished steel hull in the Polish shipyard of Gdansk. A hull with almost the exact dimensions of the Preussen. This ship was intended to be a sail training vessel, but the project had run out of funds. Kraft purchased the hull and changed the layout of the interior. New bulkheads were welded in place to create brand new living spaces, staterooms for 228 passengers, and accommodations for 120 staff and crew members. The ship was lengthened by adding a clipper-style bow. The stern was also lengthened by 12 meters to make room for a marina platform. With the hull revisions complete, the ship was towed to Rotterdam in Holland. There, huge masts were installed. Towering more than 60 meters or 197 feet above the deck, with the upper sections on hinges so the ship could pass under bridges on her way to the open sea. Below decks, designers and interior decorators worked with the finest woods, marbles and fabrics gathered from all over Europe creating luxurious dining and recreation facilities, features never before seen on a clipper ship. Over a 14-month period, a training ship for sailors had been transformed into a luxury cruiser for international players. Shimano was beautifully, much better than the old poison, I think. She has my daughter as a figure head uh, on, on the bow, which was tradition in those days. And on the maiden voyage of Royal Clipper, when we sailed out of London down to, to Monaco for the name-giving ceremony, we stopped outside the remains of the old Preussen and put some flowers and things down there. And it was a very, very great moment for me, obviously. <laughs> Over a 14-month period, an investment of more than $60 million had brought about a magnificent transformation. A boyhood dream had become a reality. And the spirit of the Preussen was called forth from its watery grave. But now, the true test would begin. Would the Royal Clipper be just another cruise ship with masts instead of funnels? Or would the romance of the Clipper ships awaken a special passion in everyone on board? The world's biggest sailing ship, the Royal Clipper, has been designed and built for the world's best-heeled sailing fans. They have flown in from cities all across the United States and Europe. Paying an average of $2,500 a week each, they have come with great expectations. And then I did what I wanted to do when I started my seagoing career when I was 16 years of age, to be master on a tall ship, on a sailing ship, and I'm very proud to be the captain on Royal Clipper. They come on board for a certain reason. They, they read in the brochures, they read in, they, they did read all books from Joseph Conrad and about the Clipper ships, and so they have a certain expectation. And when they come on board, then if the expectation match with the reality, that's fine, then they are happy. As night falls, the ship's master casts off. Captain Jürgen Müller Seeran left home at 16 to become a sailor. A veteran of 30 years' service in the German Navy, he's a well-seasoned master mariner. Give a lot of slack so that we can get the line off. Thank you. Lego press line, King. Okay, Lego press line. East to starboard 10. 
suddenly people get to understand that's not only speed and most fantastic uh, technology, they also get to understand that there is something else. Let's call romance of sailing. So they want to mix it. They want to have the romance of sailing, the moon and the stars on top of the sails. But they also want to have a good service and uh, if, uh, the ship not rolling too much and uh, cabins and food and everything fantastic. So this kind of mixture is, makes uh, the whole atmosphere on board. For the 20 sailors who make up the Royal Clipper's crew, the rhythm of life aboard is centuries old. They stand watches, adjust the rigging whenever the ship changes course, and keep a weather eye open for dangerous, quick-forming squalls. Routines that haven't changed much since Christopher Columbus sailed these waters at the end of the 13th century. on the same area uh, where Christopher Colon been 500 years ago. Same island, same area, same wind, same sun, same uh, sea, but uh, I, I don't think so that it's something uh, changing from, this, uh, from the last century at least, yeah. Because the Royal Clipper is so big and carries so many sails, she has to be crewed by specialists highly experienced tall ship sailors. And many of the world's best are Russians, trained in the Baltic Sea aboard Russia's famous tall ship fleet. We're looking for the skill and not for the nationality. And the Russians have the tall ships. They are very competent in handling sails, sail making, in maintaining and repairing uh, whatever is going on in the mast. So, the Russians for us are a very a great asset, no doubt, and they do a great job. set and furl the triangular stay sails and two of the lower square sails by hand to give the passengers a look at sail handling as it was done in days gone by. But instead of sending 60 men aloft to set the main sails, the Royal Clipper has a system powered by hydraulics that can be operated by one sailor stationed on the deck. Instead of all hands to the block and tackle, it's one finger to the big red button. We have made furling yards. We have built yards in Russia. Uh, uh, yards, you know, it's the part which holds your square sail, the, the, the horizontal mast. And these yards can furl the square sail scene in order to make it more safe hydraulically. This is, of course, new technology. On each of the yard arms is a small hydraulic motor. It's connected to a rod that passes through the yard. This means that the sails are unfurled or let out, and then furled, taken back in by one sailor standing at a control console safely below on the deck. Fast. 
Royal. Coming out. Experienced riggers only have to climb the masts to do routine maintenance or free a tangled sheet. Even so, on the Royal Clipper, that's a trip of about 60 meters straight up. Like climbing up the side of a 20-story building, a building that's rocking in an earthquake. For Captain Mueller Searan, the ease of sail handling on board Royal Clipper helps to avoid a potentially dangerous situation. In case of uh, squalls hitting the ship, we can take the sails in immediately. We don't have to lay aloft. We don't, because it's dangerous. With the remote control, we can uh, operate this uh, hydraulic motor, get the sail out and in in terms of minutes. It's a kind of a challenge to be on a ship where you have to deal not only with navigation and uh, to be on right track and course and speed and so on, but also to do this with the sails. The difference between sailing a square rig ship and one that has fore and aft sails, like a schooner, can be illustrated very simply. Canadian tall ship captain Neil Otten. Traditionally, uh, large square rig vessels aren't known for their tacking ability, <laughs> so they don't come up into the wind very well. They are uh, trade wind vessels. You talk about the trade routes, and those are based on wind and um, wind and current. So they follow with the wind and current. So there's a, the wind is always abaft you. It's always behind you, pushing you along. Whereas schooners tend to be much more uh, handier vessels. They tend to go upwind better. So you can uh, go against the trade routes or you can go up a coastline or into a, a little river or something in a much easier fashion than you would be able to with a square rig vessel. Sailing to a destination directly north with the wind coming from the north, a square-rigged vessel can do no better than a 70-degree tack off the wind, almost headed northeast. A two-masted schooner can get much closer hauled, or closer to the wind, and therefore the destination, with a 40-degree tack. Through a series of zigzags, both ships attempt to make port. To change tack or direction on a schooner, the bow is thrown around and the booms swing across the deck. Relatively simple. On a square rigger, changing the angle of 42 sails is a long and complicated process. All the yards have to be shifted. And even though the Royal Clipper's crew can turn and brace the yards from the deck, it still doesn't make this massive vessel any handier at sailing against the wind. The full square rigger ship is a little bit complicated. Yeah, it's a little bit different instead how to sail with a stay sail schoon, for example. The main point uh, that uh, we can uh, sail just only 75 or maximum uh, 70 degrees to the wind. With all sails set and a steady trade wind full astern, even the passengers can go aloft, climbing up to a height of 20 meters for the ultimate sailing thrill. So we make them very genuine to how you sailed in those days, but we make it safe. Once in Royal Clipper, we have even put sofas up in the mass, so the guests, passengers, you can go up and sit up there and see how the sailors had it 100 years ago, maybe with a glass of champagne, you know, and have a look at it. Steadied on a new course with the wind urging the massive hull forward, the sheer joy of steering such a mega ship is also an experience that everyone wants to share. Oh, it's, it's a lovely experience. I mean, it's, um, 
It's, it's a sailing ship like any other sailing ship, but it's just so different, you know, it's so, so big and so, so much power that's really great. But the principles are the same. You know, if you can sail a, if you can sail a small boat, you can, you can sail this, but it takes a bit of, you know, it takes a bit of practice. <laughs> it takes a bit of practice, because it's slower to handle than a small ship. And so when you make a mistake, it takes you about 10 minutes to get out of it, you know, instead of, instead of one minute. <laughs> One wrong move at the helm during a stiff breeze, and a lot of sailcloth could be shredded. Fortunately, the sails aboard the Royal Clipper can withstand a lot of punishment and will power the giant ship to more than 20 knots or 35 kilometers an hour. But to get this kind of performance, the builders of Royal Clipper had to seek out the best sail makers in the world and ask them to build a suit of sails the like of which had not been seen for a century or more. Catching enough wind to drive a ship weighing 5,000 tons takes a lot of sailcloth. For Royal Clipper, that meant 58,000 square feet of Dacron. Spread out on the ground, it would cover 13 NBA basketball courts. For the sail-making company of Doyle Plotch in Florida, it was a huge challenge. One which would combine traditional skills from the past as well as the new technologies of the present. Well, as a sailmaker, I go back a long ways with my grandfather, and it was a little bit mixture of the old traditional vessels mixed into some modern requirements that they asked for, but I was already familiar with square soles and things like that. The first challenge was to come up with enough materials and hardware to make 42 sails, cloth, thread, tape, rope, and grommets, an enormous exercise in logistics. For one thing, the color of Dacron required for the sails was not available in the quantity needed. And then they had to literally weave and finish and dye more cloth to complete royal. So we wiped the planet of that type of cloth. Then the laborious process of assembly began, working in the traditional manner, putting panels together by hand. And this is a, is a hydraulic 35 press ring that goes through hydraulics. And then their shackle attaches from this to the stay, which holds the sail to the stay. Fortunately, Doyle Plotch was able to develop a computer program, which allowed its cutting machine to carve out the Royal Clipper sails in a form which was geometrically perfect. sailmaking perspective, it's replaced one of the traditional steps that took so many man hours and so much floor space. It took away the rolling of the cloth back and forth in the, what used to be called the first layout uh, portion of sailmaking between the, the CAD program and the design office where you design the sails in a computer. We can now do away with that whole step and simply cut the sails. The only thing that has amazed me is that we did this. It was a big learning curve. It was a struggle. It took a long time. And we built the sails, 42 of them, shipped them off somewhere, and not a reported problem. And that's amazing to me. You know, in any type of manufacturing, you can get a phone call. We haven't even gotten a phone call. <laughs> so that was, that was pretty amazing. So I guess everything was OK. No sailing ship gets through heavy weather without some tearing in the sails. So Royal Clipper carries a skilled sailmaker, armed with a heavy-duty sewing machine. The sail he's repairing was torn during last week's Atlantic crossing. In the chart room, the navigator lays out the voyage to maximize the use of sails. You cannot always sail 
You cannot, as you know, go up to the wind with a sailing boat. So you have to do the planning according to wind. And that's why it's a lot of changes being made as well during the passage planning. The course that's been plotted will take Royal Clipper to many islands over a period of seven days. Approaching some of them can be risky business for a ship that is itself the size of a small island. You have to have, keep a distance of half a mile to that edge on that island and just drop anchor in the area. With the Royal Clipper resting at anchor, the real work on board begins. It only takes 20 crew members to do the actual work of sailing the ship. The rest of the staff runs a Caribbean luxury hotel. Dollar for dollar and creature comfort for creature comfort, the Royal Clipper can match any ship in the world that traffics in luxury. The largest of the three on-deck swimming pools has a glass bottom, which provides lighting for the only atrium ever built into a sailing ship. Descending three decks, the atrium illuminates the three-level dining room at its base. This is one of the two owner suites. Each has a private entrance by stairway from the main deck, available for about $5,000 US per person, minimum four persons, for the seven-day cruise, but only when the ship's owners aren't on board. Other accommodations include 14 deck suites, like the one being inspected by the hotel service manager. Okay. Standing rigs. Hmm? These suites feature a private veranda overlooking the sea. Yep. Okay, so now let's go. The chambermaid waits anxiously for a vote of approval that everything's ship shape. Have we found anything here? <laughs> yeah. I hope. Huh? I hope. Nothing, nothing. Accommodations fit for a queen, like the Queen of Sweden pictured here. She has been on board many times and takes a personal interest in the ship's welfare. In fact, it was Queen Sylvia who christened the Royal Clipper at a ceremony in Monaco. The ship's godmother, Queen Sylvia of Sweden, she calls me from time to time and asks, Michael, how is my goddaughter? So she also starts liking her ship. She feels really that it's something with the soul, something alive. It's a great, great personality, Royal Clipper. And what if there is no wind? Will the romance suddenly vanish? Will the passengers find themselves aboard a noisy, smelly diesel yacht? Will the captain have a mutiny on his hands? Or does the Royal Clipper have an answer for that too? As a lot of couples have discovered, romance can take you only just so far. And on Royal Clipper, there will be days when the romance of sailing becomes, well, becalmed. But lack of a breeze to fill the world's biggest spread of canvas won't stop the island hopping. Royal Clipper has propulsive power to spare down below the waterline. Engines, electrical systems, air conditioning, desalination pumps that keep the ship on an even keel. Royal Clipper has lots of hidden secrets most of them designed to keep the sailing experience as mild as possible for the passengers, even though the crew have trained all their lives for bigger challenges. Pavel Petrov is the chief engineer, a veteran of the mighty Russian sailing fleet that still sails with full crews up in the rigging, voyaging out of the stormy Baltic Sea to appear at tall ship festivals all over the world. Well, you, you know, sailing ships uh, always for Siemens, it's like dreams. Uh, work on the sailing ship, it's dream from the youngest, yes. Uh, this uh, engine 
a bit noisy, but very high quality. This is the best thing. Two 2,500 horsepower engines can drive the ship at 14 knots or 22 kilometers an hour, keeping her on schedule when the winds fall away. The engines share a common exhaust, which vents through the hollow steel jigger mast, discharging the smoke and fumes high above the stern, well away from the passengers. If the ship needs to run silently, after the guests have retired to their cabins, for example, or if the sails need a gentle assist, the propeller shaft can be disconnected from the diesels and attached to a whisper-quiet electric motor, which will maintain a steady four knots. There is no reverse gear. Instead, Royal Clipper has a controlled pitch four-bladed propeller that can be reversed at the touch of a button to pull forward or push back. Most importantly, the blades can also be feathered, made to lie flat, reducing drag when the ship is making good time under sail. With all the high-tech below deck, and the snap of a sailcloth echoing above their heads, passengers aboard the Royal Clipper can enjoy the romance of the 19th century with lots of 21st century reliability and safety, out of sight and out of mind until it's needed. Sailing the tropical trade winds, but keeping a very tight schedule, an island a day keeping boredom away for the 200 passengers, because most of them like to sample the romance of sail in fairly small doses. Let's say 80% of the guests are happy to do a little sailing in the morning and to do a little sailing in the afternoon when we leave. Yeah, so two hours sailing, more or less, is fine. Another feature that's seldom seen, but often felt, is the anti-healing system, controlled by these pumps, which fill and deplete ballast tanks on both sides of the ship. The ballast tanks also keep the ship stable when riding at anchor, despite the fact that the enormous weight of the skyscraping masts will tend to make her roll. With the anti-healing system turned on, it pretty much guarantees a rolling motion of less than 11 degrees or just about the perfect motion for keeping spirits safely inside a glass. Cheers. Dealing with the luxurious lifestyle expectations aboard Royal Clipper creates an enormous demand for electricity. Thousands of watts served up to power a full-time, full-ship air conditioning system, galley, electric winches, radar, communications and desalination system that produces 80 tons of fresh water a day. Using a process called reverse osmosis, a thin multi-layered sheet or membrane will allow water molecules to pass through but acts as a barrier to salts and other chemicals. Since a fundamental law of nature requires the salt water and fresh water to seek the same level, the fresh water will flow back through the membrane but by applying outside pressure to the salt water, pure water will be forced back through the membrane, leaving the salt behind. To prevent the salt from clogging up the membrane, a cross-flow filtration stream carries it off to a reject port. In this way, the reverse osmosis process can continue non-stop, producing a clear and delicious torrent of water. Water to United States standards. Water for showers water for cooking, water for ice cubes, and fresh water, if required, for three swimming pools. And there's still a lot of water to spare. We use about 50, 60 tons per day, and production is 80 tons per day, so it's more than enough. Now we sail? Yes, we're under sails only, and uh, 
with a good breeze, making seven knots, eight knots. That's good speed. Yeah. That's the best of the day, leaving for any ship. The threat, the danger is on shore when the ship is alongside. As soon as we are at sea, that's the best of the day. Aboard this luxury clipper ship, where every moment is meant to be super special, tomorrow night has to be really extraordinary because it's the night of the captain's dinner. On this particular morning, the mood in the galley is more excited than usual because tonight the captain is hosting a special dinner. Even though the chef and his assistants prepare up to a thousand meals a day, on this day, they will be expected to reach for that extra measure of culinary creativity. This is the kingdom of Chef Victorio, a Barbadian who has worked in the finest clubs and restaurants of New York and Miami. This kitchen is very small, but it's well designed. And guys on the ship for eight and 10 years working on the same ship, there, there, there is a system. We have a system that we work under. And if, if one guy sign off, another guy comes, comes on board, he got trained the same way that the guy that get off. And we, we, we so used to serving, for me, I used to serving three, 4,000 passengers on the mega ships. This, this little small ship is so easy for me to serve 200 passengers with, 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 no, with no problem at all. It's just, it's just a system, systematic. Like most of the operations on this ship, the kitchen has to function with a mixture of race and language. In fact, there are 27 different nationalities among the 103 staff members. The more, the better. It's, it, the problem starts only when you have one nationality in one part of the ship. Uh, let's say if all the cabin stewards are Indonesians or all restaurant people are Philippines, then they start some kind of mafia internal, which you cannot control. This is the first cup. Second cup, the Garmadier. Dimitri, Francois. This is the official chef. This is Mr. Andres. Mr. Barris. He's also the first cup. This is my appetite salmon. We try to mix which gives a lot of good atmosphere. They have to speak English with this, each other, and uh, that's working fine. Riding at anchor, it's a long way down from the teak deck to the surface of the sea. So Royal Clipper, the world's largest, most luxurious sailing ship, carries her own marina dock. Okay, the uh, marina platform is fantastic and allows us such a great opportunity to, uh, to do a whole range of water sports. We're going to do some snorkeling, okay? So, to take some snorkeling equipment. We have also your swimming suit, your sun cream, a hat, your sunglasses, and your good mood, your smile. And then we go. We do banana boating, uh, uh, water skiing, wakeboarding, uh, we take diving trips from the, uh, from the boat. On the starboard side we have a compressor so that we can fill the, uh, the tanks for diving. We, uh, we keep all the dive equipment and all the uh, water skiing, uh, etc. Uh, stored in the, uh, in the aft of the ship here. The hotel services manager from the world's largest sailing ship is heading to the beach to check up on the world's most elaborate beach barbecue. Carrying up to 60 passengers, the Royal Clipper's tender is a luxury version of a military landing craft. With its undercut bow, the tender can run right up on the beach. When you storm ashore from the Royal Clipper, you don't have to wear combat boots.
everything ready, Francois? Yeah. Okay. It's ready. Ladies and gentlemen, we are open. This is the spot where you find the best hamburger in the whole Caribbean. With the ship at anchor and most of the passengers on the beach, the hotel cleanup continues. And down here in the laundry, a sheet isn't a rope, it's just another sheet. The captain's dinner is ceremoniously brought to the tables and it's very carefully orchestrated. The hors d'oeuvres are created. The word prepare doesn't seem to fit the occasion. The main course is a choice of succulent lobster tails or Biff Wellington. of the wind in the sail stabilize the movement of the ship. So then the ship may be a little bit healing, not much, just a little bit, and then she stays like this. And then you start dreaming yeah, how nice sailing is. Yes. And finally, a toast to a safe voyage and pleasant memories. Santé à la vôtre. Cheers. Some wool. Okay. When night falls, the Caribbean adventuring continues. Only now it's inside. In the main lounge area, where some of the best musicians in the islands are firing up their steel drums. It's a party that could have rocked on until dawn. But at 11 o'clock sharp, the steel drums are silenced. The band is put over the side, and the ship sails away to a final star-shrouded anchorage. Tomorrow, the Royal Clipper will sail on the final homeward leg to Barbados. Over the next four months, three to 4,000 passengers will spend at least $10 million to cruise aboard Royal Clipper. Is a cruise on a tall ship really worth the cost? And for the ship's owner, was it worth the investment? The biggest sailing ship in the world. A bold attempt to honor the long lost German tall ship Preussen carries one of the biggest price tags ever paid for a dream boat. But for Michael Kraft and his $60 million investment, it seems there was little choice. And it's not driven by money. On these vessels, I have been uh, different things, cruise director, sailing master, dive instructor, and, and God knows what. And I've sailed a lot on them myself, and it's really very, very fun. And now I have myself about 20,000 close personal sailing friends. And for a sailing man, I think what could be more rewarding, you know, I cannot imagine of anything more fun to do in life and it's more interesting I think than having dividends on your shares. Men love toys don't they? This is a great great toy <laughs> and uh, I haven't had any better toys for a long time. <laughs> it's great. The sailor calls his ship a she. You have an emotional relation with the ship, without doubt. The ship is, is not only his home, not only his, his world, but it's, it's, uh, it's his existence.
framed against a Caribbean sunset, Royal Clipper is both a last glimpse at the golden age of sail and a living testament that the age has not quite vanished from our planet.